Oh hi, I didn't see you there. I am Philbert D, or rather, a photorealistic CGI recreation of Philbert D. This is Phil on Films. This week, my letters to Happy and The Lion King. TJ Trinidad is Abbott, a career-focused workaholic who goes into a tailspin following the death of his mother. Then he meets a girl, Happy, played by Gliza de Castro. Happy rolls through his life like a hurricane, forcing him out of his very comfortable shell. Later on, he learns that Happy has issues of her own, and he has to step up to help her deal with them. This is a Manic Pixie Dream Girl story. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, it's a romantic story about an unhappy guy, generally affluent, who's just drifting through life. He then meets a quirky, free-spirited girl, generally younger than him, who shows him through her free spirit that there is more to life than just being dour. This is a story best exemplified by Zach Braff's Garden State, which has lost a lot of shine in the last 15 years. The downgrade and regard has a lot to do with the inherent weaknesses of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl story. The woman is never truly the focus, nor is she even a fully formed character. She's mostly just a collection of quirks through which the main male character can find some escape from the relentless grayness of his life. To be fair, this film does seem to try to address those weaknesses, but it doesn't really work. It brings up this worthy social issue, but it doesn't go very deep into it. It seems to have this vague aim of awareness without really grappling with the seriousness of the topic. Add to that this, the film's strange rhythm, its weird scenes that seem disconnected from each other, and you're left with a movie that has some nice moments, but just feels slight overall. Two stars. This faithful remake of the 1994 animated classic once again tells the story of the lion Simba, voiced as a cub by J.D. McCrary and later on by Donald Glover. He is the son of the King Mufasa, who was betrayed and killed by his evil brother Scar. Simba, tricked into believing that he was the cause of his father's death, goes into self-exile, leaving Scar to rule the Pride Lands. Nothing I say is probably going to keep this movie from becoming a hit, but I will just say that if you want your kids to experience The Lion King for the first time, I'd rather you go back to the 1994 animated version. It's really weird to call this a live-action remake when it's actually just another form of animation, and it is a less interesting form of animation. As I said in the synopsis, this is a pretty faithful remake but they just made it look like a Nat Geo special. Now, I like Nat Geo specials, but I would be freaked out, for example, in a Nat Geo special if the animals started singing. It just doesn't fit. The thing about animals is that they don't have the exaggerated facial features that make singing and dancing and saying Hakuna Matata feel natural. There is this disconnect between what you're seeing on screen and what's happening around them in the story. You're watching this realistic looking warthog and then you hear Seth Rogen's voice and you try to put it together in your head but it doesn't really work because you can feel Seth Rogen making faces but you don't see the warthog putting on the same face because that wouldn't be realistic. The goal of photorealism for this movie really hampers it from being any fun. Really, when you get down to it, it doesn't even really succeed in being photorealistic. A good example of this is the Hakuna Matata sequence, which was clipped in the Jimmy Kimmel interview of Donald Glover, where, yes, they look like real animals, but there's no weight to them. It's a problem-free philosophy, Hakuna Matata. It would be really weird for a lion, which weighs like 450 pounds or something, to be dancing around because his weight would be causing all manner of chaos around him. But they make him dance and pounce around like he's like a 10-pound like a house cat. And it looks really weird. There's this Twitter account, Cartoon Brew, that did like a side-by-side -side comparison. And it's, um, it's just really weird and sad like to lose the expressionism of the characters for the sake, for this vague aim of photorealism, which doesn't improve anything. 
Honestly, this movie lost me as early as the I just can't wait to be king sequence. If you remember in the original cartoon, it's almost this Busby Berkeley homage where the animals line up, they form like weird shapes, they become this like giant stack of animals and we view them from above because that wouldn't be realistic. This film instead sells for the two lion cubs running through a stream through the legs of the animals and it's just not as interesting. Clearly, I don't like it as much as the 1994 original. So yeah, it's still The Lion King. The story kind of holds up. The lack of fun visuals actually highlights some of the weaknesses of the story. It makes you think more about how uh, we're basically rooting for a prince to come back to. <laughs> um, there's some monarchy stuff that's like weird and feels outdated. It still kind of works on that level. It's just kind of weirdly a slog. Also like 30 minutes longer for some reason and I genuinely can't tell you why. As far as I can remember, it's exactly the same movie but with more boring visuals. I don't know. It feels like the wrong way to do things. The same complaints I had for almost all of the Disney remakes. I had the same complaint with Beauty and the Beast where I realized while watching Be Our Guest that like I couldn't see the face of Lumiere because instead of like a weird shape candle man with a with his mouth between the candelabra and the candle we had this like tiny Ewan McGregor and we couldn't see his face can we do something else now please two stars let's answer our question spank the monkey on YouTube asks with your point about increasing Filipino film critiques without getting too technical, can you share basic points or criteria that we should take note of when watching films? Also, what do you think we can do as the viewing public to become better audiences? Of course, aside from spending some coin. There's this re misconception about uh, film critics that they go into movies with like a checklist of things they want to see, like what they're thinking about immediately. It's like, oh, is the lighting a certain way or does the plot structure work in whatever? There's actually somebody here that replied, I know your question is directed at Phil, but in my opinion, learning to see a film objectively is key to proper critiquing. That's also a weird misconception about film critics in that we think there is some objective truth about movies. All criticism is subjective and we should celebrate that. I think the power of critique, power of criticism is that uh, a person can express their personality by how they react to a specific work. There isn't a specific technical point that I, I can tell you about because like whatever technical things I value uh, come from my personal experience. I was trained as a writer, I was trained in fiction and poetry. So when I watch a film, like I, I can almost just see story structure overlaid over the images. Like, I, I feel the rhythm of a movie. And that's, that's something I value. The real crux of it is about that second question, well, how do you become a better audience? And the whole thing is always, it always just goes back to asking yourself why you like or dislike something. And it doesn't have to be some brilliant technical breakdown of a movie. It doesn't have to be literary criticism. It doesn't have to go back to some theory. Uh, I give this example all the time. It's like um, when you ask yourself why I like that, why I like a certain scene, it could be something, um, it could be something as simple as uh, it reminds you of something else. I like this scene because I like Scheider, and that scene reminded me of Scheider. And then you ask yourself, what is it about Scheider that I like? What is it that evokes Scheider in the scene, even if it's not like a actual scent, I think. But the more, I think good criticism is about revealing yourself. There's this whole thing where, you know, critics aren't, are, are, aren't, aren't brave, right? It's, a, it's artists that are really brave. But like, good criticism is as brave as, as it's all just another piece of art. It's just revealing yourself. Uh, it's just telling people, this is what I think and this is where I come from. Well, good film criticism is about taking your own personal experience and viewing a film through that lens. I know my experience is limited. Like, I watch a film, I was a worse film critic uh, as, a, as a younger person because I hadn't been exposed to as many experiences. I love watching, I love reading a, f a critique that comes from somebody who had a completely different experience from me. Because, for example, there were some Mindanaoan critics who viewed Birdshot were telling me like that they didn't like the film specifically because the film didn't seem to know 
uh, how eagles actually are, how monkey eating eagles act. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I, I wouldn't know. And uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been right for me to speak on that. But like, um, taking that perspective into account gives us a richer discourse on the film itself. So, I mean, it goes beyond just the technical bravura, right? If somebody's a Marxist or a feminist or just comes from a strange school of thought, those are the most interesting reviews. Don't get hung up on ob objectivity because there's really no such thing. No person is a robot who has like the perfect uh, metrics for judging a film's quality. These are pieces of art and we connect to them in personal ways. And good criticism is about expressing how it affects us directly. Ongas on Twitter asked, how to convince Vice Ganda to elevate craft in her films? It's a tough one. You'd have to accept the premise that there's no craft in Vice Ganda's films. And I disagree with that. There is craft in it. It's just not the kind of craft that you might be into. There, I mean, there's a lot that goes into a Vice Ganda film. There's a lot of comedic writing. There's a lot of special effects, generally. I will say that I did hear of a Vice Ganda project that Vice Ganda wanted to do that was that she already pitched with a star that you wouldn't expect to work with Vice Ganda. It seemed to be like a more serious story that was shot down by Star Cinema. So I don't know what to tell you. Maybe Vice Ganda was, is already convinced that like there's something more to be done. Yeah, I have no clout. I don't know, I don't know how to convince anyone of anything. But yeah, um, I don't know, let them know. Everything I've heard about Vice Ganda is that uh, Vice Ganda is genuinely convinced of the value of the work that uh, she already does. So whoever ends up working with Vice Ganda can just elevate the craft of it, whatever that means, under their own terms. I don't know. There was a project. There was a project that maybe someday Vice Ganda will do. So thanks for joining us. I'm gonna remind everybody that Cinema Live is coming up in August. Uh, get yourself ready for that. You know, file your leaves and everything. We're planning to do something special for Cinema I Don't know yet because uh, time is weird and work is hard. Like and subscribe, leave a comment. Do ask a question on the thing, I'll answer it. Uh, do all the internet things and until next time, goodbye internet, leave the MMFF alone already. How did you hear Bongo is planning to do a summer MMFF? Which is like, there's already the PPP, but okay. There, it's specifically pointed out in the release that it's something separate from the FDCP program. Uh, Bongo, Bongo wants a lot of visibility. Okay, um...